this study is not driven by data analysis in 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 a standard way. It's a theoretical paper. Yeah, it it's, it's doesn't actually test any particular hypothesis. It develops an argument, and the argument is supported by the simulations and by the data analysis. So the development of, on, of the argument builds mainly on the observations that people have been making before, based on the fossil record and uh, based on probably living species, but also on theoretical frameworks that people have been developing for the last 40 years, perhaps. So that uh, is brings uh, these pieces together and explains what people could not could not explain. What people were thinking that the, the two, well, namely the hypothesis and the, the head pattern, that they are not compatible with each other. And and since they didn't know the head pattern, in fact, uh, Professor Yuka Yanwa from Helsinki and myself discovered it in 2004 or published it in 2004, and then others have found it in many other groups. Uh, so they couldn't have known it at the time, but apart from that, in the 1970s, at the University of Chicago, they almost had the whole story. Um, two different, um, two different scientists had each had a part of it, and it seems that they didn't connect them. It's very interesting, and and one reason may be that biologists really don't like and at that time especially didn't like to use words like random to describe evolution because that immediately starts to sound like um, natural selection isn't happening everything is random and so it's, it's the trick of understanding how these random processes relate to um, adaptation by natural selection and so on, which they do not contradict. But it's it's an intellectually demanding argument and people have often, I think, shied away from it. So I think it's it's a synthesis paper by and large, yeah. mainly. There um, is lots more to be investigated in yeah. this framework. It's a new way of looking at, at, yeah. at a very old question, but which actually Charles Darwin was well familiar with. He didn't use the metaphor of, of running taken from, from Alice. He, he said, imagine the world as a sphere with wedges going in and all species pressing in. So each, when each, one wedge goes in, all the other wedges have to come out a little bit. So this is, and, but it's the same idea of competition, that what one wins, all the others collectively lose. So it's a, it's a very old idea. My mindset was always on expansion uh, because of because of the background that I had in credit risk analysis, where uh, typically we look at companies how they grow and how they expand. That's the normal state, not staying alive, but but growth is the normal state. And when they stop growing, then it's a it's a good signal that something is going wrong, and we would almost. Like when, when something really goes wrong, when the company goes bankrupt, we would uh, go back and look when was the point when it's possible to detect. And it's almost, almost always appears to be the point of, of start of decline of the company. The bankruptcy or the extinction in, in animal world is just the end, but when, when it's very close to the bankruptcy, then it's, it's not competitive anymore and it's nothing to be done. It's, it's the actual... Uh, the, the, the start of decline that you have to spot and you have to well, sort of do something about it from the credit risk perspective. So that, that was my sort of mindset and I was, when I started reading the literature, uh, Lee Van Valen's papers, this expansion perspective was very strongly there, especially uh, in his later papers in, about, yeah. about energy. Which people usually don't read. Yeah, and, and so when I thought that he actually, when he when he developed this hypothesis, uh, the Red Queen's hypothesis, and when he was thinking about the law of contents, constant extinction, he probably had the expansion perspective in mind. Then then it started it started to make sense, sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How how unexplained things can be explained, at least to a reasonable satisfaction. And this is no joke because the the two other authors have been working on this for decades, and we didn't get it, so it took Indra to do it. 
In the name comes from a children's book, Alice Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, where Alice meets this character called the Red Queen. And the Red Queen they discuss um, the differences between Alice's country and the Red Queen's country. And the Red Queen says, uh, she, she says to Alice, that, that's a slow sort of country, I mean, Alice's country. Now here you see you have to run as fast as you can to stay in the same place. And if you want to get somewhere else, you have to run twice as fast. And this is a mathematical, I mean, the author was a mathematician and he's talking about relative uh, position between species that are all moving, um, driven by evolution. Now, this is the Red Queen's hypothesis. It is her hypothesis. That's why it's called the Red Queen's hypothesis. She hypothesizes mm -hmm. this. Now here you see you have to run as fast as you can. In order to stay at the same place. Yes. So that's that's also important in, in the world of organisms that we are talking about. That uh, it's not enough just to be fit for the moment. Animals have to keep up with with the environment and their competitors and all the changes that are happening continuously all the time to be able to uh, do well in the environment. Yes, yes, and this is one of the places where different versions of the Red Queen's hypothesis don't agree. Some people think it's only about the competition between the species and if something happens with climate or something, that's something else. But uh, originally, the way it was written, it included everything, and that's the way we have treated it. Yeah, so the, or the original paper said that uh, the Red Queen does not require environmental changes, but she can accommodate them. Yeah, yeah. so therefore they are part of the, of the picture. Mo if you look in the scientific literature at what has been published under the heading of Red Queen, it's mostly about competition between two species or about a prey and a predator something eating something else. And that is actually, those are very limited and special cases of what the hypothesis originally was about. We shifted a perspective, the perspective of how people have looked at the hypothesis and at the accompanying law of constant extinction. So we shifted the perspective from the extinction event itself to expansion of the species. Uh, that the main state in which in which species operate is expansion and when they stop expanding then that's where the real failure happens and we aligned this with with patterns in the fossil record that people have been observing already for many decades uh, the patterns of this unimodality, so called the head pattern, that species come and go usually with one peak of their expansion, like, like, like a head pattern. So, they d usually, with, there are exceptions, of course, but that usually they don't come back after, after they start to decline. And people thought that this is not compatible with, or somewhat not compatible with, with the Red Queen's hypothesis that describes in a way a random process of uh, species going extinct. Yes, was it in fact designed as an explanation. I mean the observation was that species go extinct for any, any kind, any group of species of a similar kind with a similar way of life they go extinct at uh, um, what is called a stochastically constant rate, that is like isotopes, radioactive isotopes. So the, they have half-lives, but you cannot say which particular nucleus will, will disintegrate. You can only say that on, on average so many per uh, hour or year or uh, millennium will will disintegrate. And, and it's the same, the, what was described, was was observed for species was something similar and the hypothesis was the hypothesis to explain how that can be. But we take uh, the peak point as the point of where was 
the maximum expansion, uh, ma maximum occupancy, maximum share of sites that uh, that particular species has occupied. And so it can be, in some cases it can be at the beginning, in some cases it can be at the end. It's just that the typical arrangement is that uh, it looks like a hat. But in principle we take the peak as the maximum point of expansion in species history. So it, it reflects things like geographic area, uh, population size. We can explain the peak in relation to uh, competition and we can explain the extinction in relation to environmental uh, changes. Better explain. Better explain. So we don't claim that one is one and other is the other and we are not saying what particularly specific weights of one and the other are, but uh, we have observed and that's in line also with, with what people have been finding before, that extinction is like when, when species are already rare, it, it seems to be better explained by um, changes in the environment, not the environment itself, but changes in the environment. Whereas the peak is better explained by intensity of competition and that's in a way that's intuitive because if there is if it's crowded, if there are already many species and the resources are limited, so inevitably more of them have to turn down somehow because of limiting capacity of limiting resources in the environment. And on the other end, it also has been observed, and we also see it in from from the analysis that we did, that like environment is more prominent uh, factor at the end of of species existence, and it's probably because when species is already when when there are already few individuals of relatively few individuals of, of the species left then they are more vulnerable to changes that happen in the environment you don't have so much uh, uh, capacity to accommodate uh, turbulences that happen and so if if, if some uh, more severe uh, changes happen then they probably are more likely to go extinct and on the other hand when species are rare so they are probably not most exposed to competitive interactions because the most intense competition perhaps happens among the species that are uh, common, well, abundant in a way. Mm -hmm. So, and I mean, this is conservation biology knows this very well. One of the main reasons for species being threatened is that they are rare, um, and, and so, so I mean, this this fits completely with that kind. Of I think that this work is opening a new line of research, not closing an old one. Yeah, yeah, I agree. 